Marguerite in Gounod's Faust. The role of Victoria de Los Angeles made her own at the Metropolitan Opera in New York in the 50s, one of the handful of truly great international starry opera houses, a very long way away in style and behaviour from the unostentatious and warm artistic atmosphere in Barcelona, where she grew up in a poor but loving family, where her operatic career started at the Teatro Liceo. Victoria de Los Angeles, if I remember right, that's where you got your true grounding, where you learnt a lot of your roles, slowly, carefully, because you were still very young. But then everyone said you should try to go further, to go abroad. And did they send you to a competition in Geneva? What was it, in 1947? I went to Geneva, and I never thought that I'm going to win. First of all, I didn't like it to go out from Barcelona. Mm. I was so attached to my family that it came as a shock to go to Geneva. And I went without my mother. First time in my life I went alone. So I won the prize. Somebody called me from the Scala de Milano. Signorina Leia Guadagnato, uh, you, uh, you have won. Uh, can you come to a Scala to make an audition? I said, no, no, I have, I have my tickets to, to, to fly to Barcelona. I, but you can change it. You go to Milano, Barcelona. I said, no, 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 I go, I go to Barcelona. <laughs> I love it. I must go home to Barcelona. It's so different, isn't it, from these days when you'd probably have been signed up by an agent for work three years ahead. So you go back to Barcelona for another couple of years, and then Rudolf Bing, the general director of the Metropolitan Opera in New York, signs you to go there. Now, by this time, what have you done at Liceo? The Countess in The Marriage of Figaro, Mimi and Boer, Marguerite. You've been in Lohengrin and Tannhäuser, master singers. So, so you must have been absolutely ready professionally for the kind of work that was going on in New York. Because wasn't Bing one of the most rigorous of men? Didn't he really go for good music, the best voices? Was it there that you met for the first time Nikolai Geda? I sang with him Manon, and he was a perfect écrieur. But I met him in Faust, I mean, in the recording with Werther, and etc. Oh, yes, he's a wonderful musician. And he was a very elegant. It was a privilege to sing with him. Wow. Unforgettable. Nikolai Geda in full flood in Faust. Now, he's another artist who's still singing after something like 50 years on the stage. I wonder whether another of your partners, your, your tenor partners, would also be singing if he hadn't died so sadly. Jussi Björling. He also had an unforgettable voice, didn't he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Björling is different. I mean, Björling was a very natural person, very warm person. And the voice of Björling has never been kept well in recordings. The voice of Björling was much more beautiful in person. That went through your heart it was the quality of a voice with a lot of poignancy. And the first time I heard him it was when I came to the rehearsal at the Metropolitan. I was going into the room and I was so moved by the color of the voice. 
I have never forget this moment. Io t'ho germita, ti serro palpitante, sei mia. together when we make the recording of Butterfly and we walk to the streets of Rome together. It was so simple person. Was that the re that recording when he was actually very ill? Yes. We was in the finale of the first act, just in the last note. He fell down and he went to the hotel. The doctor was with him and the doctor told him to stop and he said, no, no, I must finish the opera. And the day after, he was nearly with a heart attack. Nearly with a heart attack in the recording and then died a few weeks later. Yes, 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 yes. But he never wanted to stop singing, even if he knew that he was very sick. final moments of Act One of Puccini's Madame Butterfly with UC Björling. I get the feeling that both Björling and Gerda are not, were not, of the usual run of tenors. I mean, you've talked about Björling's voice, you've described Gerda as a musician, but tenors aren't noted for, well, what shall I say, the smallness of their personality, because isn't everything pushed to one side when, when they decide to hold the high notes? <laughs> <laughs> and like to hold the well, center stage. Well, the ladies also. Yes. There are some ladies. They, they like to stop in the, the notes and they forgot about the music. The world of tenor is to give top notes and to put the public up in their seats. And they know that they must give this excitement, this excitement yes. And so they are all the time thinking about this. But I, but I think it is interesting to see each colleague, how we function in life and in the opera. <laughs> but it seems to me that you've been a very lonely person in the world of opera. On one side, you were the star, you know, the applause, the excitement. Uh, yeah, but I, I have never lived, been inside of this, this excitement of operatic diva. 
Uh, I suppose it is because my conduct, it was nothing to do with the diva. I was in my hotel and I said, tomorrow I have rehearsal of uh, Bohem. So tomorrow at 10 o'clock rehearsal. I went to my rehearsal. I did my rehearsal and I went out of the theatre to the hotel. I never was a diva. I never went to social parties. I, w I was very well known in, in the United States that I refused cocktails and cocktails and cocktails. I, I said always, no, 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 no. And finally, nobody invited me. They, they knew that Victoria mm, didn't want cocktails, didn't want to go to social parties. It is nothing to do with that I didn't like it, people. I felt so shy, I suffered so much in the parties. You see, and, and the questions were always the same. Where do you go? Where do you come? What are you singing? I like you very much, or you see, and I was very tired of that. And so I didn't make a life of diva. And in that time, you see, all the singers that came to Metropolitan, the first thing they bought was a mink coat. Without a mink coat, you were not a diva. And I used to left my mink coat in the hotel. I, I always put a, a woolen coat. Did people expect you to be the diva? Because there's a sort of expectation that um, a star, as people think of you as a star, should be out there in parties and in the fur coats and in the stretch limousines, you know, spending yeah, yeah. money and staying in the best <laughs> yeah, of hotels. It's a great imagination. Well, in general, yes, the public loves that. So many singers, they respond to that. Many friends of mine, they were telling me always, you are completely wrong. You must do like if you were very important and making gestures and all that. But I couldn't do it. Even if people love prima donnas and divas, finally they accept that somebody can make a career without making such a fuss. <laughs> I was very struck by a story you told in your biography about going shopping for powder in an American department store. Oh, yes, true. Nobody make... Uh, Took any attention of you? Uh, yes. You went in as Victoria, as, as your as ordinary natural. person. I mean, yes. I'm natural. Yes. And I said, I want that. And she said, well, this is the only thing we have. So I don't have nothing else to show you. And so I, I disappeared. I mean, I, I felt that I, I, I was nobody. And I said, well, I, tomorrow I must come. And I was so angry. I went the day after, I put on my main coat just to see if it was true that the exterior of a person makes so much influence in others. And I went to the same place and I said, I want this kind of powder of Elena Ruin said, oh yes, madam, do you want that I show more things that I wanted? So I, I was very impressed with that. But I didn't care very much because it's very tiring to make yourself important. So it is much better to make yourself as you are. And it shows in the music. Well, I don't know. I am a kind of a, a, a diva. This is not a, this kind of a diva. I'm just a simple person. Yeah, uh, just a simple person that have something here that make good the quality of singing. This will explain yeah. something then about an opera which I'm fascinated that you sang such a lot, Peleas et Melisande, ah, yeah. because this is the last yeah. opera that, you, that any diva would want to sing, yeah. to sing the role of Melisande. Yeah. It is like a dream of an opera. Vocally has his difficulties to sound well, to pronounce well, when it's nothing to do with singing a mimi and butterfly. Eh? The actual yeah. vocal line that yes. is written, it comes actually out of the orchestra, you are part of a whole tapestry of sound, yeah, and sometimes well, it, you're forwards, sometimes you disappear. Yes, I mean, it is like an embroidery uh, on you. Everything it is arranged, but it looks like you are talking in the moments that is needed to make a conversation. It is very much near to the world of recital as an expression. It is nothing to offer as big top notes and big phrases. It is very difficult to stay in the middle of the voice, to stay there all the time and to color like an aquarel. I mean, this is... Watercolor. Yeah, watercolor, yes.
from Debussy's opera Pelleas et Melisande. And that was the very last opera you ever sang. Yes, yes. That was, what, 1980, yeah. so you could go on singing Melisande yeah. long well, after <laughs> you should sing Melisande. Anyway, cause Melisande with a cane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be very funny. I'm going, I must look to with a tenor that is like me. <laughs> Not a very, very young tenor. <laughs> a very late opera that you learnt was Traviata, which was, you only did yes. in 59. And in, in this season was Callas doing Traviata, Cevaldi and myself were the three sopranos that were doing Traviata. I learned Traviata, and it was well for me in my voice. But you see, and the aria, I was the only one to sing in the key that is written. I never wanted to put a, a, a half tone down or tone down. I was so strict with the things. Absolutely, when I, when musically I was so correct. Strict, yeah. I said, it is impossible to go and to sing an aria going a half tone down. It is to betray yourself. So I, I think it always traviata. It is was written. Adio del passato, farewell to the sweet, happy dreams of the past, the dying Violetta singing in the last act of Verdi's Traviata. Now, Tullio Serafin was conducting there, and you worked with him several times. What, what kind of a musician was he? He was a splendid Italian conductor. There was a story once that when Joan Sutherland hit top E's in yes. Donizetti, yes. he used to give her a sixpence. Each perfect <laughs> note, he would give her a sixpence. That's very good. Yeah. What, did he, what did he do for you? No, no. Uh, from Julius Serafina, I remember that when I made with him the Barber of Civi, I was doing the concertante. Everybody singing. No? And he stopped it. He stopped it. He said, Stop, stop, stop. And he made me sing alone. He said, You must hear Madame de Los Angeles doing well exactly. And I was so ashamed myself because in front of my colleagues, so I sang it alone. And uh, that's the thing. He, he loved me very much. But I enjoyed with Sully Serafin. was a very gentle man. And then what happened to you? What happened to you in the Opera House? Because when I read your biography, I follow a very distinguished career through the 50s and the 60s. You're working with the really top names, the really great names. And yet you gradually move away from it all. I wonder, was it having children? And am I not right that one of your sons has Down syndrome? Did you find that opera was no longer so important, that other things perhaps came first? I think so. I began to say no to go to Metropolitan because it would have been many months outside at home. So I begin little by little doing recital world that I could arrange in shorter periods. And uh, opera, I begin to left at the side, little by little disappear. And I remain with recital world that in reality is the one that I love it much more. So you don't regret the opera? No, not at all. The opera of today, it is nothing to do with the world of opera of the 50s or 60s. Everybody has more money, there's more publicity, there's more videos, more recordings. There's a lot of technology, but it's less spirituality. It's less moving, We're looking for moving experiences. From nothing to have art 
it produces more strong art. You have to use your, your spirit. Yes. They think a great singer is the one that takes more money, the one that is better pay. This is the great singer in the world. And it has changed completely. The values have changed a lot. The intimacy of the, the dramatic part you have inside, it has took it away from many people that sings. They are more interested in being the first. They earn a lot of money and everything has changed. Do you teach? This, this is an well, important message, and presumably yeah. are students willing to, to hear this? This year I did it. some master classes in Santander, in the north of Spain. I talk very much about that, about the things that happens inside of a human being, thanks to a composer, thanks to the words of a composer, because not only you talk that, about technique, you talk about interpretation, and I make themselves to be humble. Humility sometimes doesn't come in the mind of a singer. But with humility, you learn a lot. And I finished with them crying. I mean, crying with them. They were very impressed, not because of me, very impressed to have made a discovery. They have told me, we came here to be a singer, and we have a right to have something else. Our attitude to singing, it is different now. To talk about elevation of spirits, it is something that many, many, many pupils, they never heard. I push people to be passionate, for instance. If they sang a song like that, and I said, no, it's impossible. You have something else inside. Have you loved someone, for instance? If you have loved someone, it is impossible that you say these words that maybe you have said to a man, and you are sing these words like nothing. And suddenly they find a reality, that you are singing reality always, reality of your feelings. When you make such a push in the interior of a person, they sing much better. It is incredible, the change. And so my teaching, <laughs> my teaching, it is something from experience also, not only for singing, but from life. To say to this person, you must be very pure, don't think much if you are going to be the most admired person in the world. There's nothing to do with that, to do music. So I like very much to teach because I teach myself. I discover myself in that moment, and it was also very good for me. So I came from Santander, I came from this, and I went to my books of Schubert and Brahms, and I, I began to sing because I, all the things I have explained it, I needed to found it by myself again. Singing, it is an enjoyment, not because you sing for public and you have an applause. It is because in reality, it's part of yourself, part of the life, and it's there all the time, in anything, in the air, everywhere is art, if you can grab it. <laughs>